Um, I like pastors. <laughs> Some of my best friends are pastors. <laughs> I am a pastor. Um, and I, uh, having been for these last few years, stepped out of a congregation uh, serving the seminary. I've had a better chance to look at pastors, and I'm just in awe of how you spend your life. And I was in the parish for 30 something years. Um, so I know it well, inside and out. And I know the cost that it comes to, to do this. I know it's done and born out of a great deal of love. And so I, I don't take it lightly that I ever get a chance to speak to my peers. I want to talk uh, with you about um, uh, our true only comfort. Um, that's how the Heidelberg starts, remember? This is the one question of the Heidelberg everybody knows the answer to. That our only comfort in life and death is that we belong body and soul and life and death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, that's our real only comfort. And yet pastors like me tend to get distracted by looking for other, other things that we would uh, throw our lives into other than the only comfort of belonging body and soul and life and death to Jesus Christ. So that's what I want to look at, and the, and the person who I think demonstrates this the best for us is Jacob the Striver. So uh, each of the talks that I have, uh, it's going to be on Jacob, looking at how Jacob is kind of the anti-hero uh, for pastors, um, but one to whom we are so attracted to, um, because we get the striving part. So let me start with our text. Um, Genesis 25, verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples are born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. <coughs> when her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all of his body hair like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she was born to them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Gracious God, I ask that by your spirit you would allow us to find ourselves into this drama. Let it tell more of the story of our lives as well, we pray. Everybody has a, a dream. A dream is um, it's what you're after in life. It's what gets you up in the morning is your dream. Uh, your dream is why you left your parents' home. It's why you got an education. It's why you went to seminary. It's why you took that first church. When that didn't work out, it's why you took a second church. <laughs> uh, but you can't give up the notion of the dream. Even if you're not really sure what you're dreaming for, then the dream is to find a dream worthy of you or worthy of this stage in your life. We have to have these dreams. The problem is that they're slippery and they're hard to, to catch. But most of your decisions have been made, whether you realize it or not, based on some criteria. And part of that criteria is, does this get me to a, a dream? We get into relationships because we have dreams about them. We get out of relationships because we have those dreams fell apart. We try other, we get people come to church with dreams and expectations. We, we're big on dreaming. Now some people, when we look at their lives, it appears that their lives are just dreamlike, like they have it made. They, we look at their prosperity, we look at their good looks, we look at their family, we look at their success. We just know that some people are born right. That's Esau. He's the firstborn. So all the blessings and birthright and everything that would typically come to the firstborn are supposed to go to Esau. For the rest of us, 
Life has been more of a chore, catching those dreams. So we are more like Jacob. He's our man. He's the striver. He's the hustler. He's the one who will do what it takes. Because we live in a society that believes that some have it made and others have to make it happen. We're in group B. And so we take a certain amount of pride in how hard we've worked to get where we've gotten to. Even if we've actually lived quite a bit of privilege, that's not the way we tell our stories. Nobody wants to introduce themselves by saying, I've been incredibly privileged my whole life. No, we tell the stories as if we had to work hard, scrape, odds were against us, and we made it too. Because that's our dream. Even though people like Esau knows that the, the best dreams are not actually achievements. That's a Jacob way of thinking. But if you think about the things that are most important in your life, which of those things did you, did you earn? What, let's think of it. What, the people who love you, that would be near the top, I would hope. Children, the, a particular gift that you have, a, a sense of the faithfulness of God along the way in your life. How about breath in your lungs? None of these are things that we earned. But these are the things that are core to us. These are things that God has given to us. And because God gives these to us, then they're, they're blessings. You can't earn a blessing. This is a classic Jacob problem, trying to earn blessings. Blessings can only be given. And God is trying to give us blessings. Now you can screw up a blessing, and the easiest way to do that is by turning it into an achievement. We'll look at this uh, tomorrow morning in particular, when we look at um, how Jacob and his relationships with his wives is a nice metaphor for our relationships with church and the churches that we're serving. Um, but trying to achieve a blessing will always mess it up. Now let's, let's just review our, uh, the, the story just a little bit. Um, Jacob and Esau are twins, but they're clearly not identical <coughs> twins. Right? J uh, Esau is hairy. Comes, you can imagine what this baby looked like. <laughs> Uh, all red, hairy. That's not a good looking baby. Uh, he is a man's man. He's a man of the field. Jacob, uh, the supplanter, is of course holding his big brother's heel as he comes out. He's already making the hustle. And he's a quiet man. He's a smooth man, we're told later. Um, <laughs> it's a great verse. I don't know why that verse cracks me up, but. When he he's talking to his mother, Rebecca, he says, Esau's a hairy man, but I'm a smooth man. I don't know why I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he hangs out, and he's a mama's boy. He hangs out in her tents. Their father, of course, is Isaac, who's actually not all that critical to the story, except that he's uh, the link that Jacob and Esau have to the blessings which, again, Jacob wants more than anything. Now, the, other, the boy's mom is Rebecca. It's fascinating that uh, Rebecca is the one who's heard from God that Jacob is actually going to be the one to get the blessing. And surely, during one of those times while he was hanging out on her apron string, she mentioned this to him, I would have thought, since he's her favorite anyway, but Jacob doesn't seem to believe it, and nobody else believes it. This notion of getting the blessing was like a, a trophy that just stayed up on the, on the fireplace, and everybody knew this thing was going to Esau, because that's the tradition, that's the way it worked. And besides, Esau was the man's man, and that ancient society that meant he was preferred, and he was, um, he was just, I, I, I can just imagine that when they were kids, Esau was always the first one picked when they were choosing up teams. And at the end, someone said, all right, I'll take Jacob. So, you know, that's what Jacob has grown up with. Esau got into the best schools. Esau was valedictorian and star of the football team. Esau got into the, the most spectacular churches. Esau was uh, visited by the Pope last summer. 
um, he saw as Time's Man of the Year. So maybe your mama thinks you're something special, but you're no Esau. And he didn't know that after a while. So let's get back to the twin. He's the twin, he's certainly not the identical twin. What Esau is to us is he is our preferred twin. He's the preferred image of ourselves. The person that we wish that we were. The person who has all of the success. The person who has worked hard maybe, but it sure has a lot to show for it. The person that people like, the, per the person who can start a church and six months later there's 10,000 people coming because you got to hear this guy preach. He's, he's the kind of person that we wish we were, but we know that we're not. And so as a result, no matter how good our achievements are as Jacob, no matter how wonderful our life is as blessed by God, it's never good enough because we're constantly dragging this big, hairy, preferred twin around us who would have done it better. And so there's a constant sense of judgment. And that's what we live with. We live in a sense of judgment that we could have done better than we did. Esau certainly would have done better than we did. And pastors are not immune from that. Just because we know about the grace of God, that doesn't mean we've taken it all the way to heart. When I was in grad school at the University of Chicago, the, uh, some of the professors there were um, puzzled by the, why it is that churches that have judgmental, fire and brimstone kinds of preachers are still around at all, much less growing, like they seem to be growing. This did not make sense to anybody on that faculty. And so they did what professors do when they have a question like this, they pulled together a panel discussion. And I was there for the panel discussion. And they had uh, a theologian on the, on the discussion who was really confused that that this is around at all and thinks that post-enlightenment society, why would anybody still be listening to this at all? And uh, you know, what we need to do is to provide more enlightened uh, messages to them so they'll be freed from uh, this kind of judgmental thinking. There was a Marxist historian on the panel, which is a really unfortunate thing to be these days, um, but he was still peddling the same line about, you know, this is, this is a problem of the proletariat. They're the ones who are actually drawn to these fire and brimstone judgmental preachers. And they're just so fed up with the economic system that's not working for them, they just soon have God blow a little fire down on the whole mess anyway. Okay? Um, there was a psychologist on the panel, and her theory was my favorite, that people like going to hear judgmental hell, fire, and brimstone preaching because they think the preacher's talking about somebody else. <laughs> Him, so, not me. I took notes on all of this because I don't know, it could be on the test. I, I just I wanted to make sure I had their, their theories down. But I had been a pastor for several years before I went back to grad school, and I had my own theory about why judgmental preaching is popular. I think it's popular because people think the preacher is right. Judgment is what we've known best from, from the earliest days. We were judged by our parents when we were kids. We were judged by, <laughs> by our kids when we became parents. We were judged by uh, teachers and coaches and, and congregations. Don't you feel a sense of judgment from your own congregation? Like, this sermon is not going to go well. I, I know this was... You have a sense that you're only as good as the last sermon. And then you have this feeling that at the end of this sermon, there's going to be a special meeting of the session, and <laughs> you just, whether the judgment is real or not, preachers feel it. We feel like we're not as good as that preacher or this one, or we should, we, we, I should have worked harder on that sermon. I thought this was going to go better. I, I've actually been in the middle of sermons thinking, this is just not working like I thought it was going to last night. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just, when that happens, this sermon turns out to be a dog. You, you, you just walk that dog as proudly as you can. <laughs> it's a dog. There's no fixing it. And you feel that sense of judgment. <laughs> when I was serving the church in Pittsburgh, you had to walk past my chair to get to the pulpit and back. An associate, one of our associates gave a sermon that he did not like. I thought it was fine. He walked by me and he said, swing and a miss. 
<laughs> Judgment. We, we just, we feel that uh, constantly. We feel it in us. We, it's what we know. Again, it starts at an early age. I went um, to visit one of my parishioners who had given birth and um, I heard that there might be some complications, so I got there shortly after uh, the baby was born. It was the end of the first day, and she was crying. And so I said, oh, Martha, uh, this is, must be so moving. I just thought she was like overwhelmed with the beauty of giving birth. And no, she was crying because they had just performed the APGAR test on her baby, and he, he got like an eight, because it was something minor with his toes or something that was gonna fix itself. And she said to me, um, he's one day old, he's already got his first B minus. And that's true. And the judgments, again, just keep continuing. That's why when people come to church, um, I think uh, they're not confused about their sin. I really don't think people are confused about that. They may not call it sin, but I think that they know they have not done well enough. And sometimes when a parishioner would ask me, why don't you preach on sin more often? Uh, what they're asking for is what I call the bad dog sermon. Where I, as the pastor, stand up and just scowl at them, you bad, bad dogs. Look what you did. Bad dogs. Take, take that out of here. Don't do that in here. And the, it's the amazing thing, again, getting back to my professor's dilemma, people like the bad dog sermon. They sit there looking like scolded golden retrievers. You're right, I did it again. I, I don't think that sermon is necessary because no one's confused about that. <clears throat> We've been all dragging around these preferred images of ourselves for so long that have just led to judgment. We can never measure up to Esau. So what we're confused about is the grace of God. And it takes a career, doesn't it, just to get that message out that God is not angry at you. That's what the story of Jesus is about. Well, getting back to the, the story here, uh, Isaac gets old and blind, and he's decided that his days are coming to an end, and so he wants to pass the blessing on to Esau. Rebecca hears this, she's the one who comes up with this scheme for Jacob to dress up looking like Esau. She puts some goat hair on his neck and his arms and fixes the meal the way that Esau would have fixed it. And she sends her son into the Isaac's tent. And when he walks in, blind old Isaac says, who's there? This is a fascinating line to me. Jacob says, I am Esau. Now he's lying, of course, but he's been trying to be Esau for so long. He's been haunted by Esau's image. He's been determined right from the, the first day he was born, grabbing Esau's uh, foot, that he would supplant Esau, which is part of what the name means, supplanter, striver. That Esau has so taken over his identity that he almost isn't lying at this point. The problem is that God promised to bless Jacob not Jacob dressed like Esau. Can you imagine what this scene looked like from heaven's perspective? God's looking down with Jacob with this goat wool taped to his neck and he's saying, oh, this is my guy. This is, this is the one I picked. But God, God is not blind. Not about Jacob, not about us. And God has chosen to love us. Our only comfort is that we belong to God because he's chosen us out of the abundance of his love. I would think about this text when I would get dressed for, uh, for worship. In the churches back east, uh, we, we wear a lot of clothes uh, to preach it. Uh, so I, I got a collar on, I got a cassock on, I got a Geneva gown over that, we got flags coming off of us. <laughs> I, 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 one, I'm haunted by my mother who told me when I was little, Craigie, if you have nothing to say, you should always look nice. <laughs> this is my thought going into the pulpit. He 
Second thing I'm thinking is that I'm going to get halfway through this sermon and someone's going to figure it out that I'm pretending. And they're going to stand up and say, he, he doesn't, he's just pretending to be a preacher. Let's go get brunch. I mean, I, some days that's what I'm thinking. The, the sense of fraud or, or pretense, again, it's all because we're holding ourselves to a judgment that God refuses to hold us to from the beginning. I have a friend who was a pastor out here in a very expensive community, and he, um, when he first got the job as the pastor of this church, he still had uh, his old uh, student car, which was a Volkswagen. And he felt like every time he turned the engine on on this beat up old Volkswagen, that it said, failure. You turn the engine over and go, failure, failure, failure. Because he would then drive up into the church parking lot, he would see the beautiful cars his parishioners were driving, and he would drive failure, comparing himself to his congregation of Esau's. Well, finally, after he worked there long enough, he got enough money, he bought a new car. It wasn't anything exotic, but it was brand new. This car also talked to him. This car said, fraud, <laughs> fraud. You're just pretending to be the pastor to Esau's. You're just, you're really... Jacob, fraud. God does not think we're frauds. God does think that we're Jacob's, though. And that's the person God's chosen to be loved. One of the things I used to say uh, frequently to my parishioners, trying to help them understand what it means to receive the grace of God, is... Um, Usually this would come up in benedictions even. I would say something along the lines of, you can spend this week uh, with the most fundamental choices. And that fundamental choice is, are you going to spend it trying to achieve your life, or are you going to spend it receiving it? Hmm. If you make achievement your goal, your constant companion is going to be complaint, because you will never achieve enough. If you make receiving your life from the hands of God your goal, then your constant companion is going to be gratitude because now you're paying attention to all the things that God is doing. I don't know that there are spiritual measures um, for us, measures of spirituality, but if there was one, my vote would be for gratitude. Um, the grateful people are the ones who are, again, paying attention. An, almost a synonym for spirituality, by the way. Paying attention to what God is up to, what God is doing. It's hard to do that when you're an overachieving <coughs> pastor. Because what you're focused on is what you're not getting done. Rather than what God is getting done in the church. Constantly focus on what you're not getting done. When I was serving the church in D.C., I um, came back um, from a General Assembly meeting, so I was already in a foul mood when I got into the church <laughs> office. And um, I'd been out for most of the week, and my office was just littered with those little pink pieces of paper that say, please call, only they don't mean please, they mean call me right now. <clears throat> And so I was way behind on that. I had lots of appointments to catch up on for the ones I had missed. I turn on my computer, I see all this email just like at the speed of light. Like, like this is the only miracle I'm going to see today. Just buying of this email keep increasing. This was before smartphones, so I had to get caught up on it. I couldn't do it along the way. So I had all this email, I had all these phone calls to return. I had appointments. As, about, right, as I was diving into the, um, to the phone calls, my admin assistant comes in and says, don't forget, you're uh, taking communion to Mrs. Lenz today. And I said, oh, no. Today, yes. Why? She said, because you're the pastor. <laughs> hate her when she's like this. Mrs. Lenz is, or at least at that time, she was uh, 97 years old. She'd outlived her husband and all of her siblings and all of her friends. She'd outlived her son, who died early. 
So she was all alone in this nursing home. And she was almost completely blind, and her hands shook a lot. Uh, but she was a cherished member of our church, even though no one in the church except the pastors knew who she was anymore. So I'm in the car driving to the nursing home with my little communion kit, actually praying for God to help this go quickly. Can you believe that prayer? Help me get through this sacrament in a hurry so I can get back to my, to my busy work that I'm behind on. I get into the... Uh, nursing home, and this woman is just such an angel, I mean, and she has such a wonderful sense of humor. I say something to her about how wonderful it is that God has blessed her with long years. She says, nah, she says, my family and all my friends are in heaven. They're thinking I didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of pierces my workaholism uh, for the moment. Then I to kind of rush into the communion liturgy, I said something about body of Christ broken, got it, we, we got the wafer in pretty well. <laughs> I knew the cup of juice was gonna be rough. <laughs> and I got it, and sure enough, it went all over my slacks. I just thought, oh, this is something else that isn't going right. Got everything tidied up, said a quick little prayer. What is that, quick little prayer? Said a quick little prayer. And then I got up to leave, having patted her on the shoulder, got up to leave, and then Mrs. Lynn started praying. She began the prayer, I'll never forget it, thank you Jesus for not forgetting me. Thank you Jesus for dying for me. Thank you Jesus for giving me this pastor. Oh. Oh. I sat down on the bed and she was my priest that day. Mm -hmm. Paying attention, letting God's angels, whoever they may be, break through the sense of, I have to achieve it this week. Because as long as you keep making achievement the goal, even as a pastor, as long as you keep trying to follow the preferred twin image of yourself, you're just gonna keep feeling the judgment. And in Jesus Christ, God was dying to get you off that hook. Tomorrow we'll look at what happens after Jacob uh, totally messes up uh, his home life through swindling his brother out of the blessing. It's already swindled him out of the birthright. Uh, and then we'll see, as I said before, some of the, uh, Jacob's own family uh, issues with J uh, Leah and Rachel. And then we'll look at um, some of his struggles with work for Laban as our struggles for work. And then we'll end with looking at his, his wrestling with God. That's where we'll be headed. You, um, can we take some questions or are we done? Sure. Or? Take questions. Any comments or questions or theological observations? Yeah, I guess when I think about um, your comment about God being blind, I know, I know it's part of the injustice. Um, is it no, God is not blind. Well, no, I know. Okay. <laughs> we count on that. Was God totally blind to the oppressive nature of the patriarchal system that gave all that power to that one person to give that blessing and not give that blessing? So could you comment on that? Was God blind to the patriarchal system? No, I don't think God was blind to the patriarchal system, but I don't think God, in this case, overthrows the system. He subverts it. He's not challenging the system. He's just saying he's not going to play by those rules. And so then he uses Jacob's scheme, or actually Rebecca's scheme, to still give Jacob the blessing. But that was God's intent from the beginning. So that's what I mean that he's being subversive here. Later, you know, we find God challenging our systems, but not so much with the patriarchs. So it was sort of a reversal of power, you know, in a sense. Yeah, you could say that. Right. Why didn't Esau value the blessing that he was going to sell it for his due? 
We sold the birthright for the stew, but he seemed to be more interested in the blessing. I'm not exactly sure why that, that is, but I do know he wants to kill his brother after he takes the blessing. I, again, it gets back to the system. I think this, so much of Esau's esteem was built on this system that he was the preferred one. And that's what the blessing meant. That's why I said it was like a trophy on, the, on, the, on their mantle. And uh, that's the role it played in ancient society. Um, and so by getting blessed, um, he, it was the affirmation of all of his preferredness. Uh, um, and Jacob has undermined that. Do yeah, you does. think that the, the role of the seminary in regards to the student coming through with the education and tools of using that education has changed since you were in the seminary to help the students realize this dual nature that they'll experience within the life of a pastor? Um, I don't... I'd love to say, well, it certainly has changed at Princeton, um, but I don't, I don't know that it has that much, um, because it's interior to the students. It isn't so much, again, it's not a system problem. I mean, it's the students, the student has had so much judgment upon her or him before they ever come to us. And, and they've had enough good judgments to feel like they, sh they can stay at the game. And, they, and they've, they've moved up from junior high to high school to college, now they're, now they're doing a Master's of Divinity. And so they're just, they, they keep getting grades. And you know, if you're getting good enough grades, you can keep saying, oh, then I should be okay. But, but then when they're done with school, and I, I mentioned this to them at graduation, it's like, we're, we're running out of degrees for you. It's gonna be time to stop now. <laughs> and, and you're gonna have to enter into uh, uh, kind of the, the malaise of confusions about judgments. Um, you don't, you're not gonna keep getting report cards, uh, but you, get, you sure get a lot of judgments. Uh, as you all know, the judgments from your parishioners, the judgment, worst judgment of all is the one from the person in the mirror. Um, so I, what we are trying to do is to best as we can, and this is part of my what I talk about with the students a lot is I do try to intersect with that. To say, you've got, you've got to get your act with God together before you get behind a pulpit. Because frankly, five minutes into a sermon, a congregation can tell if you and God are getting along or not. Because preaching comes from the soul, right? It's not, it's not something you do from the head. And so it's all about taking care of the soul for the sake of the congregation. That's the most important thing that I try to teach our or seminarians. It's for the sake of the congregation, you have to take care of your soul. They need to at least believe that you believe. They need to be able to lean on their pastor's belief. They need to believe that you actually believe what you're saying from the pulpit. Do they find that in, the, in academia? Do you try to build some of that wellness, that uh, wholeness into their culture that they've just been up. Yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. I mean, each school does it differently, uh, but each school, I think, is concerned about it. Uh, at our school, we're, we're still a residential community, so 92% uh, of our students live on campus. So we have a lot of opportunities other schools don't to work with cohorts and spiritual formation and, and groups out of the dorms and departments. Um, and then we have the daily worship, and then we have some classes on spiritual formation and classes that I teach on pastoral ministry focused on these, these pastoral identity issues. Other schools do it in very different ways with much more rigorous um, spiritual discipleship programs than we have. I'll tell you what's fun though is when I was teaching at the seminary in Pittsburgh, uh, it was fun teaching the MDivs trying to convince them of these things and then teaching the DMINs where it takes like five minutes to get the discussion rolling mm -hmm. because they don't need to be convinced. Yeah. Do you also see that, that that's just part of the maturation of, you know, usually people don't go into spiritual direction until they're 35 because there's, there's a sense of um, developing within themselves the awareness of the need of the hunger, that there's something not working. This Esau, Jacob thing's not working. Right. Might not be able to name it that way. 
but there's there's a hunger for that more, and it becomes not a bigger congregation, but it's God. Right. Yeah, the ones I worry about the most are the brightest students that leave because they're going to have enough achievements still to convince themselves that they can actually pull this off just by dressing up to look like Esau. Um, and so you have to have enough of that pierced before you're really interested in things like authentic spiritual direction. And to hear heavens saying, this is my beloved whom I, whom I love. I don't want to take you off the theme of the evening, but you gave a trigger point there between the end of and the deep end. Um, are you considering reintroducing the deep end? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there another question? <laughs> <laughs> Turn the camera off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. No, the reason I'm laughing is that this question comes up at every alumni group that I go to. We have a D-Men task force, um, hard at work on it. We stopped doing the D-Men at Princeton because we had stopped doing it well, and we were using too many adjuncts. The faculty tend to get really focused on the PhD students, um, and so some faculty doesn't, don't see a problem doing both D-Men and PhDs. Others, um, others do, and so the faculty have taken a year to to look at it, and I don't know what the verdict's going to be. The reason I ask that is, I think that's true. You're out in the parish a while, and you are more aware of the soul. Right. Um, and and uh, I, I, I just see, I thought we had a very good demon program. At Princeton? Yeah. We did, but it, it wasn't cared for well, and then it, it became, it started out really strong, really good, and then it it, um, because, due to lack of attention, it, it was not good by the time we stopped doing it. That we were, had the only DMEN program in the country that was losing money. Because we were spending it all on adjuncts. Yeah. Right. So if we do it, we'll reintroduce it, but it'd be different. We're going to insist that it be done well. Yeah? I, I love the question that you call the fundamental question. Mm -hmm. Are we going to live to receive or to achieve? profound and provocative. And I certainly see that Jacob is living to achieve rather than to receive. I'm, I'm pondering, was Esau doing the same thing in his own way, or was he being addressed down the road? I'm, I'm pondering Esau at this point. Yeah, Esau is really interesting, um, mostly as a, as a Esau's interesting in, this, in the narrative, it seems to me, mostly for his influence on Jacob. I mean, he's, what, he's, who, he's who Jacob wants to be. We don't really know that much about Esau, mm -hmm. except that he's out of the covenant, by the way. Uh, we're told that. I have a dog named Esau, and he's definitely out of the covenant. <laughs> <laughs> big, hairy dog. He's, he was well-named. Um, <laughs> no, he's not right. We didn't get that right. Um, but I think, that's, I think that's the role of Esau in the, in the biblical narrative, that he's, he's the obsession of Jacob. Uh, my, my personal experience has been that the best way to get past this desire to achieve and succeed is to have a massive failure in your life. Is there any other way to do that as far as Wow, isn't that a really good question? Um, yeah, I think there can be a lot of kind of C-grade uh, experiences of, of failure that didn't work out so well. But you, and you can have, believe it or not, some people have parents who are really pretty good at teaching their kids about this and raising them not to be stars and trying to get them to be like normal. I keep meeting people who had really healthy parents and they, they're happy with their parents. It's, Really, they're out there. There are really a lot of people who've had good parenting, and that's made them what William James would say, the healthy-minded kind of spirituality. Um, but um, it's really hard to understand how God can love you for being who you are if everything you do succeeds. Because that just feeds into the, the Esau syndrome.
Yeah, of course. The kind of dynamic that you're describing really resonates for me internally and really resonates for me for sort of the upper middle class Presbyterian culture. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm wondering about the extent to which you've seen the same thing at work in cultures that are not achievement driven, that are more sort of family cluster driven, mm -hmm. or you know, sort of their identity is found not in what they do, but in how they fit into the clan system or something like that. And, and do the same things play out in a different sort of way, um, such that the word of grace still has to come like you're describing, or are you speaking particularly to um, to our illness? Well, it's certainly a, very much a wasp illness when it comes to achievement and what I'm talking about. But I think with other cultural um, and racial ethnic groups and other cultural systems in other parts of the world, where the focus isn't so much on your individual achievement, but your identity in the family or the clan, it's really the same dynamic then. Uh, is, is your identity as a member of this, um, this man's son as important as being the, the son of the father in heaven? Uh, you still need to pull out from whatever, whatever the basis of identity is that the culture provides, whether it's kinship or whether it's achievement or whether it's... Um, poverty. It, I'm sorry? Even poverty. Whether it's your place in that. Yeah. Yeah. Part, part of what I think grace has to do is provide the alternative identity to the besetting one. Mm 